Psalm 55 is the most interesting psalm. In fact, when I looked forward, because I'm not covering every psalm because there's a lot of them and I would be in them for the rest of my life. So uh, a lot of them have the same motif. Uh, and so I don't want to do the same motif over and over and over again. But when you look at uh, Psalm 52, where uh, David dealt with uh, dragons in his life, uh, then if you look at Psalm 53, 54, 55, there's a whole bunch of them where he, he talks about uh, his issues as a, as a godly politician, what he faced. Uh, and in chapter 55, uh, it is most interesting. It's very similar to chapters uh, 50, 53, 54. And so I just landed on 55 uh, because it's a similar motif to those. Uh, but it, it, it goes back to the song I introduced last week. I just talked about it briefly. I was kind of shocked hardly anybody had heard of it before. Uh, the OJs. A lot of the younger people are like, is it a bird? Or is it, what is that thing? Uh, no, it's the OJs. I mean, I grew up on that stuff. D didn't you? You know, the older that you get, the great groups just start, no one knows them. It's really kind of scary. Nor do I know the new groups. Uh, but anyway, so we need to go back to the OJs for just a minute in line of Psalm 55 because their song, Backstabbers, is all about chapter 55. How do you deal with somebody that you thought was your best friend that blindsides you and you never saw it coming? Well, the OJs kind of help you out. So in case you've never heard their music, this is what I grew up on. This is good stuff right here. I know it's not a hymn. Don't freak out. We're only going to listen to the first verse about what they do. All right? You with me? All right, here we go. Hang on. Now, let's just think about this for just a minute. I, this is stuff I grew up on. But I used to listen to that when I was younger. And, like, you get the motif of the song, right? You know, you got, a, you got a girlfriend, and your best friends like her, too. So they're just doing everything they can behind the scenes to take her from you. You know, that's a backstabber. And so they had the guts to write about it ministered to me in high school. <laughs> yes, I had girlfriends. And then I wound up with all well, the love of my life for 40 years. But um, backstabbers, uh, you never see them coming, do you? This is my best friend. Well, the whole time he's scoping out my girlfriend. Huh? Uh, so the other day I was watching uh, Daryl's house, Hall and Oates. Remember Hall and Oates? Yeah, Daryl's house. Those guys rock. So they had, the, they had the OJs on there. They're a little older now like 40 years older. what they do? Man, they were barely singing. Uh, anyway, they can really still bring it. But what has this got to do with theology? Everything. Everything. Because if you take what they're talking about and apply it, apply it to life in general, especially with what we see in the Psalms, well, there's all kinds of backstabbers. There's ones that are trying to take your girlfriend from you, or in our culture, your wife from you, or vice versa. Uh, but then there's all those, all those, also those kinds of people who just nail you, and you never saw them coming for a variety of reasons, whether you uh, work at DIA, CIA, White House, you're a federal agent, whatever you are, they are people out to get you. And they're different than a dragon because the dragon's kind of a big thing and you kind of see them coming. Backstabber, never saw it. Ha I never even thought of that happen to me. Uh, scholars uh, get paid to argue over things. And so since this particular passage doesn't tell you the historical context of this particular psalm, they argue about who was this backstabber in David's life. And so a lot of uh, them debate whether it was uh, his key counselor, the head of his staff, as it were, Ahithophel. Ahithophel uh, was his chief confidant. I mean, his go-to man, his right-hand man. Uh, and when David's kingdom fell apart, when his son Absalom takes out his his, or when, yeah, when his son Absalom takes out uh, his brother because his brother took advantage of his sister, talk about a messed up family. And then Absalom later tries to, through insurrection, try to take over the country. Uh, and then David uh, basically trying to deal with his son, trying to usurp his authority as the king. Uh, Ahithophel, at the time of great political turmoil, when there's this insurrection within David's family, as son, uh, Absalom tries to take his dad out, Ahithophel leaves David high and dry all by himself. And I tend to think that this, uh, this was the backstabber behind David. And David is sharing here from his heart emotionally, I can't believe that happened. How, how, how now do I function when my best friend deserted me at my most critical hour of political turmoil? How do you deal with a backstabber? Uh, yours might not be political, it might be personal, it could be a friend, a husband, an aunt, an uncle, who knows, a professor? How do you deal with a, a person who stabs you in the back? So this is an emotional chapter, uh, and it's going to go all over the gamut. And so how many verses are there? Do you have a Bible? 23 verses. Is, uh, this is a simple question. Is it possible to cover 23 verses in one sermon? Well, if the sermon's three hours long, yes. Uh, 
Since we only have a few minutes, we're going to cover all those verses. We're going to do it quickly by principalizing what David tells you here from his advice on dealing with the person who deserts you. Uh, Idea number one. Uh, He says in verses one to two, uh, when you deal with a person who deserts you, like Ahithophel, stabs you in the back, uh, well, give God your request. Notice what he says. This is to the chief musician with stringed instruments. So uh, it's a contemplation of David as he analyzed his life. He wanted all future Israelites to understand how you function as a godly person when people desert you. He says, give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me, hear me. Why? I'm restless in my complaint and I moan noisily. I mean, I I am so groaning over the loss of my best friend. I just, when I'm alone by myself, I just just moan about it. It's the saddest thing that I have ever seen. This is what David does. He's overwrought and he's undone by this desertion. So he goes to God and he prays to God uh, and he gives God, um, well, his request. And he's telling God, how he feels. Now, I don't know how you are when you pray with God. Do you feel like when you're talking to God, sometimes it's like a chess match? You know, when you play chess, it's not like checkers. Checkers, you kind of move quickly. Chess, you kind of just sit there for like 30 minutes or an hour before each move, right? Don't you? Don't move quickly in chess. Then it's like, oh, you're not going to win. Analyze all possible outcomes. He says, you know, God, when I pray with you, I don't want to go through that chess thing. I just want to come out and just talk to you. But when I talk to you and tell you what's going on in my life, I just feel like you're not listening to me. That's what he's saying. He said, God, I, I, I was just requesting that you would listen to me. Because when I pray, it doesn't, I don't, it doesn't feel like you're listening to me. Uh, last week, we talked about how we as Christians are, are really used to the, well, the, kind of the McDonald's kind of treatment in life, right? When you go through a drive through Starbucks, whatever, you talk to the little box, you drive it to the window, you want your stuff. Who wants to be directed to a side parking stall to wait for your food? Ever happened to you? It's like purgatory. It's like, am I ever coming out of here? Where's the food? I mean, I'm, I need my food. So we go to spirituality and we think if we go before God's throne and we've been stabbed in the back, we're emotionally hurt by somebody uh, who has deserted us and we go and tell God the situation that he will take care of business quickly in our lives. Not always. Sometimes he sends you over there. Could you park over there for just a minute? He sends you over there. Uh, you ever feel like you pray in, in heaven's brass? Well, think about it this way. The the longer that you live with God and walk with God, you will find out that God is working in all kinds of situations in lives, people's lives, to orchestrate events, to lead it to where he wants it to be. You need to be patient. Did you hear me? You're just impatient for me to get to the second point. I can feel it. You need to be patient. God, 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 help me to be patient as I'm praying for you to help me and not think you're not listening to me, that you're working behind the scenes. Because think about it. Uh, softball question, uh, uh, is, th- does God know everything? By definition, who he is, right? He's omniscient. Is he omnipresent? Yeah, by definition, definition, who he is. So how could you even articulate, would you please listen to my prayer? What would God be saying if he's looking at you from the throne? I don't know if you can hit on a throne, but hello. I'm omniscient and I'm omnipresent. I got it. I got it. Uh, so when you are dealing with a pain like that, it's, it's, Well, tell God how you feel. Do you tell God how you feel or do you preface it with a whole bunch of things? Now, God, I don't want to offend you before I say this. I don't want you to get upset at me. No lightning, but I got to get real. I got to tell you how I feel. Just tell him, tell him, tell him. Uh, What was his occupation, David's occupation? It's twofold. What was his job? It's a Bible trivia question. It's It's not a trick question. It's a really easy question. He was a king and he was a military leader. He was both those things. Uh, he had issues with the people underneath him. And so he tells God, man, I've been praying about these things and I, I just don't think I'm getting through to you. God, would you please listen to me? So you might need to tell God the same thing. God, I just feel like I'm getting creamed here. Could you help me? Number two, uh, give God your reasons as to why you feel like you do. Don't just walk into God's throne and going, I'm feeling lousy. I feel like my heart's been hurt. No, God is a judge. When you go before a judge, uh, he's gonna want evidence, Correct. Could you imagine an attorney coming before, you know, a prosecutor coming before the bench? Uh, I've been in courtrooms before to present the evidence. And he's like, hey, Your Honor, I'm kind of just feeling like he's guilty. You know, I went to one of my friends as a Supreme Court justice out in California. He said, hey, you got to come see me in action. So I did. 
<laughs> it was interesting. There was a, uh, the defense attorney was talking about how wonderful his client was, great family man, loves his community, loves people, etc. Prosecutor got up and said, remember when, when you used to print out on those printers and uh, it was the green and white bars that went across the page and it went through the little roller things and all the pages stuck together? I mean, it's like an accordion piece of paper. And so the prosecutor got up and said, uh, Your Honor, uh, I just want to let you know uh, that this individual is guilty. He's a lifetime criminal, and I want to show you his rap sheet. So he brought out this huge stack of paper, held it up as high as he could, dropped it. It began to undo the accordion thing, and it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of crimes. He said, here's the evidence. So when you come before God's throne with uh, how you're feeling and what's going on in your life, articulate it to God. Notice what David says. Because of the voice of the enemy... Because of the oppression of the wicked, for they bring down trouble upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is severely pained within me, and terrors of death have fallen upon me. God, I'm not doing very well. Here's the evidence. Uh, people, i.e., in my kingdom, uh, have arrayed themselves against me uh, and stabbed me in the back. And now my best friend and counselor, Ahithophel, has deserted me and has gone for insurrection with my son Absalom. I, I, it's hard to take. He gets real. Uh, years ago, I went to a, a, a pro-life dinner because we support Sanctity of Life Ministries. And so I went, and I've been to many of them. They're wonderful places to go. We're one of the biggest contributors for, for uh, uh, pro-life in uh, Northern Virginia, and rightly so. And so I've gone to a lot of those dinners. So one of the dinners, I was sitting waiting, because we have multiple tables. And uh, so I was sitting waiting to uh, you know, have the dinner and, and listen to the speaker. The speaker was Cal Thomas, and I've read a lot of his books. And I've heard him on the radio. He's a great man of God in a godless world. And boy, is he brave. Uh, and so before the dinner, somebody came up to me and said, would you like to talk to Cal before he speaks tonight? Some things you don't even have to pray about whether it's the will of God or not. I'm like, are you kidding me? I can talk to Cal? Yeah. Uh, first name basis now. So sure. So I went behind, this, you know, behind and they had a special room that he was in. Uh, I went in to meet him. I don't know if you've ever met him. He's really tall. I don't know what he is, six, five, whatever he is, he's a really tall man. I went and told him how much I appreciate him as a pastor, as a Christian, the books that he writes, they've helped me learn how to talk to my culture, etc. And so he's very gracious, and he said, uh, would you like a free book? Do you pray about that? <laughs> no, no, I'd love, hey. He said, my, my new book at the time was called What Works? Uh, and it is a book on how to fix our culture. And boy, does it need to be read today. Uh, he has a chapter in there, uh, part three. Uh, it is called, We Can, as Americans, Solve Our Problems. And in here, he talks about, in that chapter, we can solve our problems. He, can, he tells you how not to solve our problems. And he writes eloquently and painfully about all of the hate mail he has received over the years as a godly Christian in a godless world. And he must be like keeping tabs. I mean, keeping the evidence at hand. Because he goes way back in his life when he started and, until the current when he wrote the book as to all the hate mail he gets. And, and, and the goal of the hate mail is to destroy him, shut him down, silence him, discourage him. They, they want the radio stations to take him off the air. I find it interesting how intolerant the tolerant are. Don't you? Did you hear me? It's totally logically incongruous. And then once they're in some kind of place of power, they're totally intolerant. That's another sermon. And so he, he writes in here, if you want to get anywhere as a culture, stop the hate mail. Stop the hate mail. Uh, they won't deal with his, his argumentation in his book, the reasoning. No, it's just rhetoric. He said, uh, I'm kind of like David. God, they are oppressing me uh, with their wicked ways, and they want to, well, shut me down and take me off the air. Um, he's, he says, stand your ground with God and give God the reasons why you feel like what you feel like. Number three, uh, get really real with God. Verses five to eight. Remember what, were, what was David's occupation? Twofold, he was a king and a politician warrior, right? So he says, how do I feel as a, as a, as a warrior who's been in combat many times? He shares his heart fearfulness and trembling have come upon me and horror has overwhelmed me. God, I know these people want to take me out because they don't like what I stand for. I, I, when, I, I'm, when I'm off alone by myself, I, I, internally I'm just fearful of my country, my life, fear as I see what's going on. And I, and I physically tremble, David did. Uh, if you are a hardened warrior, and we have many of them here at the church, I know sharing your feelings is a hard thing to do. And I know it's a hard thing to do because when I was a sheriff chaplain before I came here for 1,300 officers, 
they were afraid even to talk to me. And so I asked him one day, it's like, why are you afraid to talk to the chaplain? Shows weakness. Huh? Well, if you have a marriage problem, what? it's strength to come talk about it, right? Uh, and so I, I know if you're in a tough situation, you want to show strength. But David says, no, God, I, I'm fearful and trembling. Notice verse 6, he says, so I said, here's how I really feel. He's telling this to God. He says, oh, that I had wings like a what? A dove. Man, I would fly away and be at rest. Indeed, I would wander off and remain in the wilderness. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Man, I, God, I would get out of Dodge if I could. Have you ever been in a situation so complex, so hurtful, so painful, you just said, God, man, if I could extract myself, I, I would get out of here. I would get out of here. I would leave. I would leave. Uh, I've told you that last week, and I'll tell you again. I, I've been there, deserted by friends that you never thought would desert you. It's so painful. You just think, I, I just, I never want a Christian friend again. I've been there. Uh, don't go there, because we're made for each other. But David says, no, God, Lord, it is so complex. I don't even know what to do. If I could just leave, I would. Uh, I have a lot of people who contact me in our church who are in places of prominent position, uh, who struggle with what's going on in the culture, as I do. And many of them ask me, should I retire? Should I switch jobs? I'll save you writing me an email. I will tell you what I say. Do not leave your post. Why? God sovereignly put you there for a good reason. It is to hold back evil and shine the light of God's truth to people who need it. See, David said, hey, I get the, I get the wanting to leave your post thing, but God, I'm, I'm just being real with you. Uh, it's just how I feel. Not that I'm going to do it, but you got to help me work through my emotions of wanting to depart. I've been down that road. Then he says, let me get on to my request. Get on to your request. He says, destroy all Lord and divide their tongues for I've seen violence and strife in the city as the leader. Day and night they go around on its walls. Iniquity and trouble are also in the midst of it. Destruction, it's in their midst. It's what they live for. And it's easy to destroy stuff. That's all they're about. O oppression and deceit do not depart from the, the streets. That's what they live for. It's hard to wrap your mind around the fact that some people, that is what they do. They are about destroying that which is good and holy and righteous and, and moving on to the next thing. And David says, you know, Lord, I have one request. What does he want God to do to their tongues? Divide their tongue. If I were to divide your tongue, what language would you be speaking? No language, because you couldn't speak without your tongue, correct? I mean, this is kind of like Babel. Remember Nimrod? I was building a, a ziggurat to the heavens so he can be like God. Uh, and he has a wife named Semiramis, and she has a little son uh, that, you know, first mother-son mother worship in the world was Semiramis and the son. Uh, it's an interesting study. Uh, but God looks down from heaven and sees what Nimrod's doing to deify man because politicians at that time and even in our day are about we want all power so men worship us. And that's going to be the Antichrist, by the way. And God looks down from heaven and says, uh, I'm going to stop that. And it's simple how I'll stop that. They are of one language. I'm going to give them multiple languages. So I've told you before, I'll tell you again, what language did I think they speak back then? Well, I think it was Hebrew. I'm just saying and God said, okay, if you're a stonemason uh, and you speak uh, Hebrew, and this person over here uh, is an architect of a ziggurat, I'm going to make him speak Chinese, Russian, German, something, so you guys can't communicate, so I'll put a stop to the ziggurat. Can God confuse the voices, argumentation, l illogic of those who are arrayed against you? Answer is yes. He says, God, would you please step into the complex situation of this friend who has deserted me, Ahithophel, my key counselor? who used to give me all my advice, would you please step in God and take all of his argumentation and just confuse it to Absalom? Would you do that for me? Because he's these people, he says, and there's more than just one, are walking around the city walls, he says, and instead of looking out to guard the nation from enemies, they're taking their vantage point to look into the city to see who they can exploit and what wickedness they can do. This is kind of like America, isn't it? Instead of looking out from the walls at our enemies to protect our people within, we have people on the walls using their positions of power to look down at the nation, to take advantage of the nation, to destroy, oppress. David says, God, would you please take their language and confuse it? Make their arguments completely illogical and tenuous. He does that. What kind of people were these? Verse 19, we'll skip ahead, says, God will hear eventually 
and afflict them, even he who abides from old. Because they, and this is how they were wired, David says, because they, these evil people do not change, therefore they do not fear God, which is what was missing in their culture, which led to dystopian. He says, he has put forth his hands, and this is not God, this is the godless person. He says, he, the person in question, has put forth his hands against those who were at peace with him. He has broken his covenant. The words of his mouth, smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they're really, they're drawn swords. So to my face, what they do, <laughs> to your face, their smile, nice. What are they really about? Well, doing you in. He says, yeah, I've met them. These kind of people, I've seen them in action year after year, day after day. They don't change, God. And because they do not change, uh, will you please deal with them? Because they will not repent. Is it okay to pray that way? I think so. God confound the voice of the wicked. He says in verse nine, destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. And then he moves on to his second request, which is eyebrow raising, uh, but not from his culture, was it? Verse 15, he says, second request, God, let death seize them. Let them go down alive into Sheol, for wickedness is, their, is in their dwellings. It's among them. All they are about is evil. That is, all. could you bring the day of the Lord sooner? I mean, think about it if you're honest. When you walk through life and you see, because I have many times, godly people dying at sometimes really young ages. And then you look around and you see extremely wicked people. And when you lose somebody really godly in your life, because this happened to me, and you look at extremely wicked people, what do you think? Why? I mean, I'm a man. You think, why? Because if I was God, I would be reversing the thing. And God allows the wicked to go on and takes out some really godly people early on because his purposes are beyond ours. But you know, he died for those really wicked people. So he wants them to repent. See, if we were God, there'd be a whole lot of lightning going on, huh? Boom, 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 boom. I feel so much better. Uh, you know, we're going to be studying Revelation tonight, right? 630? You going to be there? It's going to be fun. I'm not saying it's positive. We're going to be getting into the nitty gritty, but it's going to be totally appropriate for the day in which we live. David says, God, man, if I had my way, I would, I, would you, not me, but would you please just remove them from the earth? But what does Jesus tell us later on? Well, notice Jesus' example. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. What does Jesus say? But I say to you, as a Christian, what should you do toward those who are hateful and stab you in the back? What should you do to them? Nail them the first opportunity. Never forget. Put a tickler in your computer system that reminds you every January the 1st. No. Nah. What did Jesus say? Love who? Love your enemies. What happens if they, uh, you know, drop all kinds of language on me? Mm. Bless those who curse you. Oh, can I get back at them some? Mm. Do good to those who hate you. And do what? Pray for them when they spitefully use you and they persecute you. That's what you should do. That's what you should do. Uh, that's what I think we should do in our culture. When abused, when lied about, things are distorted, things are said that are not true. No, just be Jesus to them. And one day the day of Lord comes and he settles scores. Because Jesus has said, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. He is coming back. I'll leave him to take care of that. But in the meantime, I have to look at my twisted, torn up, messed up culture and friends who desert me and say, you might mean this for evil to me, but I will return good unto you. Next, we're finally getting to the sermon, by the way. Verse 12 to 14, get to the raw issue. He gets to the raw issue. What's really bothering David? Well, backstabber number one that he just mentioned, I mean, people in his life that he thought should have been with him then turned against him. Now he's gonna talk about the person who really did him in. Verse 12, it says, for it is not an enemy who re reproaches me, then I could bear it. I mean, if I knew this guy was my enemy treating me this way, I could take it. It wasn't that kind of guy. I'm adding to the Bible in case you're wondering. Uh, nor is it one who hates me, uh, who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him, but it, is, it was you, a man of my equal, my companion, my acquaintance. My, we took, he says, remember back in the day when we took sweet counsel together, walked into the house uh, uh, of God in the throng? We worshiped together. We were in Bible studies together. We were in man studies together. We went on vacation together. 
What did they tell you about going on vacation with your friends? It's not in the Bible, but it's just kind of an unspoken Americana thing. If you go on vacation with your friends, what can happen? You come back and you're not friends. You know? And I've had that happen before. It's like, oh, all right. But, but I've gone on vacation with my friends before and that are really good friends and, and they stick by you. But David says, we have done everything together. You've been my counselor. We've had advice together in private. We, uh, we shared our lives, our families. How dare you leave me in my critical hour of political need and you side with my son Absalom who's trying to overthrow me as the king? How dare you walk away from me? What kind of friend are you? You ever been deserted like that? You ever been deserted like that? Uh, I've had it happen. Liz and I've had it happen. It's most painful. It's most painful. Um, years ago, when I was a young pastor, I had a couple at our church, a great couple. Uh, got to know them very well. Um, and I knew that the wife was in the New Age movement. Not a positive thing. I knew that because she, she told me and he told me. And so she was coming back to Christ and wanted to grow in her relationship with Christ. And I was all for that. She loved the church. It was a teaching church, etc. So, you know, one day I went out with my friend for breakfast before work. Uh, we were having a great breakfast over pancakes, and he posed a question to me. Here was the question. Hey, Marty, I know that you need a women's uh, ministry director at the church right now. Perhaps you could select my wife to be the leader. Excuse me? <laughs> uh, why? Um, well, I think she's perfectly suited, suited for it. So we had a nice, frank discussion, a nice discussion about why that could not happen because... What was she in prior to breakfast? New Age movement witchcraft. And so I said, hey, I think it's fantastic. She's dedicated her life to Christ, wants to get on a new track, grow in her faith, but I don't think she's in a position now. I could not, as a pastor of the church who's protecting the sheep, put her in that situation. She's not ready for that situation yet. Maybe later, and I know she's a great lady, but down the road. He's like, okay, I can understand that. I can go with that. He left that breakfast and took the opposing position. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Uh, it got so bad, I finally said, uh, we need to talk. So they both came in my office. They wanted to talk to me. I wanted to talk to them. We're friends. We sit down. We have a nice discussion. They, I share with me, what's going on? Well, how are you guys feeling? What are you guys thinking? I, and then I shared how I'm thinking, what I'm feeling. I'm the pastor. I can't put somebody that's spiritually mature in charge of all the women, okay? I can't do it. It, it, it. Maybe later, but I can't now. We had a nice discussion, at least I thought. And my wife and my mom uh, can attest to what happened after that. Uh, prayed for them. Uh, they then went out of my office and began to tell everybody at the church before they left the church. They went in to talk to me and I yelled and screamed at them the entire time. And I'm being totally honest here and transparent. Just to, to tell you, I've been through it. And I'm like, what a lie from friends. Because I don't yell at sheep, I don't yell at goats, I don't even yell at wolves. <laughs> well, if they're in my front yard, I would, but you know. <laughs> you know, uh, I get the raw issue thing saying, God, oh my, I have totally had that happen to me. I've totally had that happen. Lord, Lord, it's hard to bear. I, I went to worship with this person. We went swimming together. We went this, we went that. And you're kidding, they stab me in the back. You know, uh, you will be tempted to say, I will never have another Christian friend. I'll tell you again, do not go down that road. Move on and say, God, uh, you got to send us some more friends because you're going to need friends. Don't cut yourself off. Uh, and do confront them in love. I did. Do pray for them. And the hardest thing is to free of them. And I've been down that road to open the door to say, hey, let's get back to where we were before. Uh, and... Uh, you're called to do that. It won't always come that way. In fact, some people are so deceived in what they have done and stabbing you in the back, they will tell you who done, as David says here, I, I was at peace with this person. I didn't do anything to them. They will look at you and tell you, when you say you're sorry to me, I'll forgive you. Huh? Been, have you ever been there? Da this is David. He's saying, I didn't even do anything. God, Here's the raw issue. Pray for that person. Be Christ to that person. Stick close to God. And lastly, get on the road. Well, it's the road to righteousness, righteous living. Here's what he says. Notice his advice. As for me, in my situation, what does he say I'll do? What does he say? I will call upon God. 
in the Lord, he shall save me. How often am I going to do it? Once a year. Now, evening, morning, and at noon, I'll pray, I'll cry, I'll lie out, and he's going to hear me. I'm going to be in his throne telling him, Lord, this painful situation, I don't even know how to work through the emotion. I don't know how to deal with it. You, you got to help me. Will you help me? Will you help me? What else does he pray? He says, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved, but you, O God, shall bring them down to the pit of destruction. Bloodthirsty, deceitful men shall not live out half their days. But he said, in the meantime, I will trust you. What's he telling you here? You need to trust God that he's going to help you in the complexities of your difficult situation of the backstabber who's done untold damage to you. He says, what you need to do is cast your situation onto him. So this is a, this is a 300 pound pack. Just kidding. Smarty humor, hyperbole. Uh, I got this from an army general. It's quite large, isn't it? Imagine if this packs on your back and in it are a bunch of rocks. And the rocks are all the relationships that went against you or people that went against you in your lifetime. And you just keep throwing the rocks in there as you keep getting attacked for living a godly life. Been there, done that. After a while, this pack gets really heavy because there's a lot of gar godless carnal people in the world who will, who will seek to do you in for a variety of reasons. You carry this thing around for a long time, it's going to wear on you. What does David say? I had that pack on for far too long. What does he say to do? What word does he use? Cast it, cast it. Take it off your back. Set it down at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, you, whew, I've been carrying that for too long. I'm going to put this burden on you. You're way stronger than me. You, you're going to help me. It's, it's, it's cathartic when you put it at his feet. I've been there. God, I cannot carry that. Will you carry that for me and, and help me to trust that you're going to bless my life when it, it doesn't feel like that's going to happen? Will you bless me? God's going to bless you if you've been taken over by uh, a backstabber. Uh, and he's going to give you strength and courage to move forward in a way that will, wow, astound you and um, amaze you. I've lived long enough to see it. Uh, our culture is full of backstabbers, unfortunately. And what we need to be as Christians uh, was David to them, uh, to love them and point them to the God who loves them so they will fear him. Let's pray. God, uh, minister to uh, whoever's sitting here today uh, in a way that only you can do, you can take the scripture and apply it into millions of situations way beyond what I could even think of. Uh, and so you know exactly what needs to be said uh, in a person's life. You know exactly what they need to do. And I'm just thinking today, there's a lot of people that have been carrying around a pack like that for far too long. It's, it's time to take it off and move on. And we pray you to help them to do that today. Uh, sometime today in the, in the parking lot, in the car, on the way home, uh, and give them a, a great flow of peace in their life that things are going to go in a completely different direction for them. We praise you for who you are. Thank you for your greatness and your love for us and for teaching us.